People had very frightening experiences then, with people shouting at them, throwing things at them. Um, even one woman had a car drive up on the pavement as if it was going to run her over. And it made you realize both how frightened and how angry many white people were at any prospect of change. On solide gouden burger hier in week op de Golden Years is de 73-jarige Mary Burton. Mary was in Argentinië geboren en het vanaf een jong ouderdom naar verschillende landen gereisd. Haar bezoeken aan Brazil, Zwitserland, de Verenigde Koninkrijk en Duitsland het haar oe opgemaakt voor de verschillende culturen van die wereld. En dit het haar geïnspireerd om te vechten voor gelijkheid. My name is Mary Burton and my birthday is in January, the 19th of January 1940. I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Well, um, my, my parents and my grandparents lived, lived in Buenos Aires. Uh, my, my father was a businessman and um, my, my mother was a, a young secretary at the time and they, they both had to work very hard and lived in a little house um, not very far from where my grandparents lived so I grew up um, in Buenos Aires learning to speak Spanish uh, as my first language but also speaking English in my own home because although my parents had lived in, uh, in South America for generations uh, they originally descended from either English speaking or German speaking families Come and have a look at these photographs. What have you got here? That's... Oh my word. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's my sister, uh, Christine, mm -hmm. and those are cousins, Carola and, yes. and Ricky, if you remember them. I can recognize uh, you, more or less, <laughs> and Christine, I yeah, recognize. Yeah, I can recognize yes, them all. Yes. <laughs> When I was nearly nine years old, my father was transferred to Brazil. So that was a big change in our lives. Um, we, we left behind our grandparents and our cousins and had to learn to speak Portuguese and adjust to a new country. So that was a very big change in our lives. And uh, at that stage in my life, my mother used to make our dresses. And she used to make twin dresses, one for me and one for Christine, identical, which was all very well. But when we grew, then Christine would get the one that I had. So she had to wear the same dress for about four years running because <laughs> she got the hand me down. <laughs> After my parents moved to Brazil, I did some schooling there, uh, but then they decided to send me back to boarding school in Buenos Aires. So that meant that I could link up with my wider family again. And I finished my schooling there in a, in a boarding school, which taught both English and Spanish. During the years that I was at boarding school in Buenos Aires, that was the, um, the middle 1950s, and it was the time when, when Juan Perón was the president of Argentina, and there was a good deal of turbulence around those issues. And in my last year of school was the year that he was deposed. So there was a great deal of, of military resistance, uh, well, resistance and military reaction. And of course, we were locked up in boarding school but we watched everything with great interest and there were uh, marches and demonstrations and so on so uh, that was a, a, a very historic time to be living in Buenos Aires. Uh, when I finished school, I uh, went to Europe and I studied in several places in France and Switzerland and Britain and I learned French and history and various other things including a year's journalism course in London and during that time my parents came to join me for a holiday and brought my younger sister and brother and all together we went to a ski resort in Austria and my husband was at the time studying a postgraduate course at the London School of Economics and he happened to go to the same little village in Austria that we were skiing in with a group of fellow students. Do you remember the difficulty of getting four boys wow. to pose together and all look respectable at the same time? They, they certainly look respectable. Look at David's hair. Yes. Slicked down with, what was that stuff called? Um, uh. that gluey stuff that you put on your kid's hair to make it stay stuck. 
Blue cream. Blue cream. No, it wasn't really blue cream, but anyway, that'll do. <laughs> to tell you the truth, we didn't have much to do with each other at the ski resort where we originally met, where the whole family was. And in the way that one does in those holiday places, you get to know people very quickly and you exchange addresses and then you leave and you think you'll never see that person again. <laughs> but certainly I recognized in her a very um, gentle, compassionate person, but a very determined person. <laughs> I don't know, it's very hard to tell really. <laughs> um, I think he's a man of great integrity. And, and he was certainly a lot of fun to be with, but you could see that he was a person with, with, uh, with very high principles and, and uh, yeah, a very honourable person. And it was uh, a stage of my life when uh, I felt that uh, there was uh, going to be only one bride for me. Um, and eventually I came to visit him here and to see South Africa for myself and to meet his family and let them have a look at me too. And uh, we became engaged at the end of that stay. But then of course I had to go to South America to uh, get married, claim my bride. In those days there were no flights across the southern Atlantic. Um, you had to go by sea. So his family, he and his family came by sea and then we got married in Brazil and then we came back here by ship. Here I was, newly married in Cape Town and I started to look around me and I suddenly realized what a very big step in my life I had taken and began to try and adjust to what I knew was now going to be my new home for the rest of my life. And of course I started to look around and the first thing was to find somewhere to live and so on and I, I began to realize how very spatially divided Cape Town was. So that was the first thing that I started to open my eyes and I began to feel very uncomfortable. You know, when I think of the fact that, that um, between 60 and 65 was the Rivonia trial, and so on, I knew so little about it. And so much later in my life, when people said to me, oh, and to think we never knew what was going on, I actually believe that some people were able to shut themselves off completely and not know what was going on. Because it was hard for me to learn it even. People didn't seem, the people I met didn't seem to have answers to the questions that I had. And one of the things that uh, shook me enormously at the time was that the Group Areas Act was being more and more severely implemented. The Act had been in place since 1950, uh, but now it was really taking place and people were being moved and the tr trucks were coming and District 6 was being destroyed and all that history and all of those people suffering so much. For what? I couldn't understand what it was about. The Women's Defense of the Constitution League was in 1955 in Johannesburg geformed by six middle middleclass women who had two parties by won. It was not an ongereeld social income, nie, but a vergadering om standpunt to the government to bespreek. The Stichters leader was Jean Sinclair, Ruth Foley, Elizabeth McLaren, Tertia Pibus, Jean Busaza and Helen Newton. The organization was later known as the Black Sash, because the women had swart gordels to draw as a symbol of their tegenstand. The main goal of the Black Sash was to let them hear about the political aangeleentheden. And they wanted to know the conscience of the white people against the free and unrechtvaardig wette against the white people to raise and transform. I met somebody whose husband was doing work, he was a lawyer and he was working for the Black Sash. And she had been invited to go to a meeting of the Black Sash. We thought, we don't know what this organization is, or a funny name, but she would go to the meeting and we would find that if, if it was any good, we would both join. And that's what began for me my political education. Suddenly there were people who did seem to know what was happening and why it was happening and to have solutions that they were putting forward. 
and who were protesting against what they see so as wrong. And it was wonderful for me. I was like a sponge just soaking up all this information and I soon became deeply involved. And I don't think that I would really have survived in South Africa without that, uh, that opening door that, that gave me an opportunity to learn and to be active. So this is where I keep all my most precious things. So that's the most precious, the black sash itself, which gets them all like that. And that's how we used to stand at our, in our protest demonstrations. Well, our mem membership was a, a bunch of white, middle class, pretty well off women generally. Um, in the later years, um, we had an, an infl influx of new, younger members, more, more feminist orientated, more progressive um, women from the student movement um, who finished their studies and looked for a, a political home. And the strange thing was that of course it gave us in this funny, crazy society a measure of protection. Um, it wasn't so easy to arrest a, an older white woman. It wasn't so easy for young policemen sometimes to do that. Now that I'm researching the origins of the Black Sash, um, I'm really interested to see how it began and in a way how conservative the founding members were. But they were absolutely appalled at the changing of the 1910 constitution to take away the right of the few people not white who still had it. And that was in 1955. And uh, in protest, they held a massive march in Johannesburg uh, to which they wore black sashes as a sign of mourning for the loss of constitutional rights. It's extraordinary now to think of those mass marches that they held of women, and they were men supporters as well. For instance, they camped outside the Union buildings for two days in protest. They held vigils outside the Union buildings for months and months and months. Um, they held a, a very dramatic car convoy all the way from Johannesburg to Cape Town in order to protest in Cape Town outside the Parliament buildings. And people came out to either wave them on or shout insults at them, depending on the views of the people along the roadside. But it attracted enormous interest. And then the legislation was introduced which made us only able to stand one woman at a time. And that was much more scary. We would stand all over the peninsula, just one woman holding a poster, and somebody else a little distance away without wearing a black sash, just keeping a watch for her safety and to prevent anybody approaching her. Uh, but people had very frightening experiences then, with people shouting at them, throwing things at them. Um, even one woman had a car drive up on the pavement as if it was going to run her over. It didn't, but it was still a very frightening and a very hostile, um, yes, a, a scary thing to be doing. And it made you realize both how frightened and how angry many white people were at any prospect of change. All of us who were, were sort of in the leadership of the Black Sash were, we know we were under surveillance, our telephones are tapped, and I mean the security records now that were exposed um, through the Truth Commission and other things show that, that, that there were records of our being monitored. The United Democratic Front had a opdracht aan the West Cape georganiseerd om a boodschap van ondersteuning aan Nelson Mandela te nemen, terwijl hij een gevangeniskap in Polsmoor in 1985 was. The Black Sash was one of the many anti-apartheid groups that had taken the Opdracht of the Freedom. The Opdracht was led by Dr. Ellen Busak. Some of the Opdracht hangers were forced to turn around as a result of police violence and power. Mary and six other leaders of the Black Sash were the first to reach the hills of the prisoners and were arrested. At the time that I was arrested in 1985, uh, they took away my passport, um, that, that sort of thing. But nothing like what many, many activists had. Yes, this little organization of white women was never going to change anything very much. And of course, we were hated by the government and by the majority of the white population. But it must have been touching a nerve that made, made people react so strongly. 
and I found myself being asked to become first the, re the regional chair and then uh, the national president. And I felt very inadequate to, to do that. I didn't think I knew enough about South Africa. I wasn't a South African. Um, and so I, I kept pushing it away as a possibility. <laughs> and I said that I felt I really needed to, to know more. And so in 1979, I took leave from the Black Sash to go and study. And I went to UCT and, and enrolled for a degree. And for the next four years, I studied flat out. And I did very little for the Black Sash. I, I was active in my branch membership, but I didn't have any office bearing. And, um, and I studied political science and some African history. And I began to feel that I understood better and I had better theoretical knowledge to equip me. Uh, to lead the Black Sash. But I came back into the Black Sash with kind of renewed energy and renewed ideas. And I became then the, the regional chair um, in, in Cape Town. And then in 1986, uh, I became the national president and um, Cape Town became the national headquarters because that was the way our system worked. Uh, where, the, where the president was was where the headquarters were. a national state of emergency was declared and went on for the next four years, which was exactly my term of office as, as national president. And in this, this was a, a great honor to receive the Order of the Daiza, which is the, um, the honor award of the Cape Province. And it was awarded to me during the time when Ibrahim Rasul was the, um, the premier of the, of the Cape Province. And then this is, is the Order of Lutuli, um, the Order of Lutuli in silver. Um, this is the book that comes with it, with the citation for all the people who received it on, on that particular day. And I was particularly thrilled to receive the Order of Lutuli because Chief Lutuli has been somebody I've always admired enormously. Um, so I was, I was very honored. My name is Abigail Peters and I've been with the Black Sash for a year and two months now. I'm actually a big fan of Mary Burton. Her story is so inspiring and uh, she is uh, one of my greatest inspirations here at the Black Sash. And I see the Black Sash going forward and, and uh, speaking for people who don't have a voice and um, helping people who are impoverished and need information to be able to access their rights. The 2nd of February 1990, the day that President de Klerk announced that he would be freeing uh, Mr. Mandela and all the other political prisoners, there was a huge demonstration planned in, in Cape Town. And uh, we had always held uh, a protest stand on the day of the opening of Parliament, protesting against one more parliamentary opening with a parliament that didn't represent the majority of South Africans. And we were all gathered in, the, in Green Market Square, ready to start a march through the city. And we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But before we started the march, we heard the news that uh, President de Klerk had announced the Unbanny. And so what was going to be a frightening and probably quite hostile march turned into an absolute dance of joy through the streets of Cape Town. It was the most wonderful experience. Nadat president de Klerk die vrijlating van Nelson Mandela en ander politieke gevangenis zowel als die ontbanning van politieke partijen aangekondig het, was het duidelijk dat daar geen plek meer in Zuid-Afrika voor apartheid was nie. Miljoene onderdrukte Zuid-Afrikaners kon uiteindelijk alle mensenrechten en burgerlijke rechten uitoefen. At the beginning of that year, I received a phone call asking me if I would uh, take some part in the elections in this province and if so would I go to Pretoria for a briefing or a training or something and so I was a bit taken aback but I agreed to go and I found myself in Pretoria uh, together with a group of other people and I was told that I was going to be the provincial electoral officer for the Western Cape. Uh, 
I could, completely couldn't believe it, but I also realized that there was no time to say no. In 1994 was Mr. Nelson Goliathlasla Mandela in gezien as the first black president of South Africa. Daar die dag dien as getuie van die rol wat baie organisaties in sluitende die Black Sash gespeel het in die vryheidsstryd. Om as 'n nasie vooruitgang te kan bewerkstellig, moet Suid-Afrikaners die verlede erken en ook besef dat vergifnis die fondasie is vir die geneesingsproses. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission arose out of all of those discussions beforehand about how we would deal with the abuses of the past. And then eventually the legislation was brought before Parliament and in 1995 only did the new government get around to passing the legislation and to establishing the commission. And there was a process of, of nomination and um, that's, that's how I eventually came to be one of, the, one of the 17 commissioners. And I think that's also one of these processes that the rest of the world looks at with huge admiration, but which we in South Africa see as full of flaws and inadequacies. And that was hard to bear. But um, I do think that it was better than simply trying to hide what had happened. When I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Mandela again at the time of the Truth Commission and we were all introduced to him, the, the new commissioners, so when he got to me, he held my hand and he talked about the past. And I could see that although he was meeting me, he was mentally remembering the members of the Black Sash who had meant something to him at the beginning of his political career. The beginning of it all, or nearly the beginning of it all. Well, Remember that day? day yes. <laughs> My views uh, about apartheid were easily uh, influenced by Mary, and uh, I thought that uh, she was on the right track. Although my upbringing was quite the opposite, I must admit. I have four sons altogether, so our household was a pretty rowdy, turbulent one for many years. <laughs> Hi, hello. I think we were we were conscientized at a very early age, um, and so we were we were certainly very aware of um, of the anti-apartheid efforts that she and other members of the Black Sash were making. What I think stands out most for me is, is the extent to which um, the, the, the women in the Black Sash supported each other. Uh, they were all in the same situation. They all had, well, most of them had young children. Um, they all had families to look after and, and they really supported each other incredibly uh, throughout, throughout those times. We used to get the occasional call where someone would phone and either say something uh, and unpleasant like once there was a caller who said Steve Beaker is waiting for you in hell. When I, when I left school I went to UCT and my mother had just started studying at UCT a year ahead of me having really not pursued a, um, a tertiary education up to that point and um, so she was in her second year and I was in my first year and we caught the same bus up to UCT together and I remember the one time being quite embarrassed when she produced a sandwich at lunchtime found me, tracked me down and I was sitting with my friends and she said, here's your sandwich now. Kind of, that's not so cool, Mom. <laughs> that too. Well done. I think that perhaps we had unrealistic dreams about what the new like society me. would be like and whether it would truly be a just and equal society with a place for everybody. And so I'm very conscious that there's a huge amount of work still to be done. Um, but I also believe that there is a great future for South Africa and for Africa and for our place in Africa. As jij betrokken bij ons wil raad en je stories wil deel, wil je alsjeblieft je postuur aan the golden years at sabc.co.za. Je kan ook commentaar leveren op ons Facebookblad The Golden Years op SABC2 of tweet at Golden Years SABC2.